Wow, this is amazing. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Robin Waters. I'm uh, the founding editor of Tech.eu. Um, and as you can imagine, we're super delighted to have this panel at Slush today. Having one of these guys on stage would be a tremendous honor. Having all three of them on stage is quite amazing. Ilka was at the first Slush ever. Nicholas, you've been through a few. Yeah. For Daniels, it's his first time. So welcome all three of them. Thank you. And Thanks. the benefit of having this kind of panel is that they don't need an introduction, so we can dive right into the questions. Um, you guys have achieved so much. Um, you've built great companies, great products. Uh, you've invested in great companies. And we're not going to talk about any of that. Instead, we're going to talk about all of your fuck-ups and all of the <laughs> mistakes you've made and all the failures you've experienced to get to this point. Um, and I want to start with Ilka, because you're the local. Uh, and I want to know what your biggest failure to date has been? Well, it's really hard to name, name just one. You know, there's been so many and, uh, and you know, I, I fail, fail all the time. But um, uh, like probably like if I would have to pick one, uh, it probably would be not even uh, at, not at Supercell, but at our, my, uh, and our previous company, uh, Sumia, which when we later on sold to uh, Digital Chocolate, and, and we were a games company. And, uh, at that company, we tried to put like a lot of structure around the creative process, uh, and uh, the end result was that it actually, in the end, it was quite sort of top-down driven, uh, hierarchical organization, which uh, you could almost say that it actually killed creativity in in the end. And and it's like it's funny to like uh, look back at those times because I mean, like what we did there, like all of those processes or all of those well-organized layers of management, like we we had the best intentions, and it was very much driven by uh, I guess my need. Uh, for sort of uh, to have this feeling of control, like when everything was so well organized, I felt that yeah, you know, everything is going well, and then we have this in control. But 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 obviously the consequences weren't that great. And uh, actually, like on top of like those learnings and, and those failures and, and that failure from the, those times, I mean that actually like led to us uh, as a group of co-founders that led to the idea of forming Supercell, where we thought that hey, like what if we did this completely differently? So let, what, what if we like uh, turned this upside down and we went to the other extreme, where the whole point was to give the creative guys, the game developers, like all the possible like freedom and responsibility, and have them to be in control, and then everybody else, uh, including the leadership and founders, would there be there just to help those guys be be successful? Right. Cool. Daniel, same question. What's the biggest fuck up you remember? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do remember it, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, um, in, in our case, um, we, we for a very, very long time um, kind of disregarded the mobile impact on the world, which today seems kind of weird. Um, so we started in the period of time when, when desktop was obviously the prevailing thing. Um, uh, it was even you know, the fact that we, we didn't even license a mobile product other than a premium product because we kind of looked at the world as this duality where you would use the desktop and the smartphone at the same time. So we figured that it was a great idea to have the upsell to be uh, you know, the mobile product. And, and frankly, for a long period of time, that was great um, because whenever people wanted to use it on a mobile device, they ended up paying for the product. But, but since we are a freemium product, we're highly dependent on also having you know, free users engage with the service and have an active community. And as the world moved more and more to mobile, um, obviously that free part of the funnel kind of disappeared. Right. So it was, it, it was like a pretty ironic situation where most of our investors saw our revenue numbers and like conversion numbers and all those things just so, sort of spiked and, and went, went through the roof. So everyone was super excited about the company, but we were realizing that holy shit, we just made a strategic mistake like three years back where uh, we have to bet the entire company to fix this. Um, and it took us probably like 18 months 
um, to fix it. So we right. had to go back to the music industry and tell them, no, actually, you know what? The thing we used to charge money for, you now need to give us for free right. um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that wasn't an easy sell. Um, and, and we're going to figure out a new way to get people to pay for this product again. And, and it's going to be a much better future. But that took like two years. And it was kind of switching out the engines mid-flight. And, and honestly, I remember the day we turned on this free service. Um, had we probably gone on for about six more months, I think we might have died as a company. Really? Okay. And uh, so that was a really defining moment. And that was as late as... 2013. Um, my so, view, f yeah, my, my view for what it's worth is like every great company has at least three near-death experiences. Right. Well, Nicholas, you've invested in quite a few companies. You've been uh, with Atomico for a little over a decade now. Um, what are some of the mistakes you see your entrepreneurs, your portfolio companies make? Yeah. Well, I also can go back to some of the things I did, but I think if you look at mistakes or, or failures that we have in, in companies is, but I think that we should not look at failure as failure. I think you need to look at failure as part of the process where we are always trying to do things and then we, learn, we try one thesis about something or, and then you try it out and it maybe doesn't work out. Okay, you, you debrief, you learn and you course correct, you try something else. And this is something that companies do all the time. So I think we need to have a culture where we need to embrace failure. And failure is the way to learn and, and, and to, to get there at the end. Sure. Well, you're well known for Skype, but there was a company before that, Kazaa. Yeah. And you mentioned backstage that Skype probably would never have been born if it weren't for yeah. Kazaa, which yeah. ultimately failed. Yeah. So, so take us back to a, that This, this is maybe a very, very good example of that, where so we started Kazaa in 2000. And for those who are too young to remember that, it was a file sharing uh, software uh, that really became big after Napster. We were half a billion downloads. We were you know, most downloaded software at the time. We, were, we got very excited that, that, like, wow, it's really taking off and becoming a worldwide success. But um, at the end of the day, it was a, a big failure because it was a financially, it did not work out. And we ended up in massive lawsuits. We became enemy number one from the US rec record movie industry. So financially, it was a, a, a pretty big uh, negative um, for us. But if, if we wouldn't have done Kaza, we would never do Skype because we learned so much about peer-to-peer -peer technology and the power of that, and also that we, as a small team from Europe, could build something that's global. So that failure, while you know, it cost us a lot of uh, stress and uh, being you know, in, in this massive litigation, and we, we learned so much from it. And for me, it just made me stronger and just having this revenge inside, like, and, and it's like, well, I'm going to succeed. And I had this always inner kind of uh, confidence that this is so powerful technology. But also when you're small and, and you're going up against big incumbents, you're realizing that I have nothing to lose. Right. You know? But these guys, they have a lot to lose, and they're big, and they're bureaucratic, and they're slow. So we thought, like, we can always you know, you know, just iterate very fast. And so eventually that led to, so we had, uh, Kassadam had jolted, and eventually we come up with, with, with Skype, which was essentially using the same technology. So we would never do Skype without those previous failures. Great. So failures are good. Great. Um, there's also this misconception that you have to fail to kind of get to success, and that it's a straight line, and it goes up and down. And once you achieve a certain level, you stop failing. Ilka, this is something you strongly disagree with. You know that if you... You know, supercell where you've already achieved is amazing, but you still must make mistakes on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we do make mistakes all the time, and, and I, I actually would be worried if we didn't do so. So, one of my favorite sayings is that, you know, if it, and this comes from a racing driver, but if it, if it feels safe, you're not driving fast enough. And, and you know, I, like, so we are in the games business, and there, as I guess in every business, it's really important to innovate, and innovation in my mind equals risk taking. And risk taking uh, means that you're gonna fail more often than you're gonna succeed. So if you like uh, think about it, like the minute that you realize that okay, the past year we haven't failed like one single time, that just means that you're not taking enough risk, and therefore you don't even have a chance to win win a big time. And, and you know at Supercell, 
Like it, it's not that you know we, we first had these failures, uh, which I guess are well known, and then we had these big hit games um, and became successful. But 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 even even at us, I mean, as I said, like we fail all the time. Like the new games that we do, they are most of the time they are failures. Like one out of ten maybe uh, succeeds if we are if we are lucky. Uh, and even if I look at as recent months, as say uh, like uh, late summer, early autumn this year, I mean we. we we had these months where we, we had no games in the top 10 globally. And, and imagine like uh, this is a team that was, has been, we were, we were quite used to like having at least one, if not two games in the top 10. And all of a sudden, like it seemed to us that every single thing that we tried seemed to go wrong. Like we, we players were unhappy with our games. The community sentiment wasn't great. We, uh, we did this like our big, the biggest marketing campaign in the history of Supercell we launched in connection with the Summer Olympics was a like complete failure. You couldn't even know that the marketing campaign is on when you look at the metrics. Uh, it just didn't work out, and then on top of that, you get Pokemon Go and everything, and and uh, uh, and, and yeah, you know, it, it, it felt that you know, hey, what's what's going on? Like uh, these things aren't working out, but but like in those times, it's so important to like uh, talk about those like uh, like we've, we've all of a company, and, and I'm so proud of like how the team sort of reacted to those, and it's it's really in, important to understand. Like, I guess going back to Nicholas's point that. The, uh, being an entrepreneur and, and you know being the, in this business, it, I mean you're going to have your ups and downs and ups and downs, and that's just part of the process. And there's nothing. Uh, uh, I mean that's that is like what you should expect when you're in this business. Sure. Well, Daniel, Spotify. At a certain point, you get to a certain size. You know, a lot of people depend on you to kind of like for their livelihoods. Um, you get to a point where essentially there's processes in place, there's structure, there's a team. Do you feel like you can still take? the same big bets that you could do in the beginning? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, so, so I, I actually think that there's, there's a very important distinction. Um, many people talk about sort of a willingness to um, have failures. I, I, I hate failures. I just want to start, start by saying that. And I don't think you should strive to make failures. I think it's okay if you make mistakes. But by the time it becomes real failures, um, you know, you probably should have discovered this much earlier. So the way I think about this is like we constantly have to make bets where we're going to be wrong about the tactics, but hopefully we wouldn't be wrong about the goal that we set out, right? So we can course correct, and if we're quick and agile, we can move faster and fix this. So we'll make mistakes along the way, but the whole project didn't end up becoming a failure. So I think you know, as you become bigger, one of the problems you're going to face is, let's say your company, you know, in a startup, if you have an investor investing in, the, in you, they're usually investing with a hope to get a 10x return on that investment, which means you have to aim to be growing at 100% or more, maybe for multiple years. And what's going to happen if you get any kind of traction is the law of gravity will stop pulling you down. And it gets harder and harder to do that. So actually, you've got to make bigger and bigger bets in order to even have the remote chance of making that growth number. Um, and, and, and then you're struck with this thing where either you make lots of small bets and you hope some of them turn into big, or you just make substantially bigger bets um, in size. Um, and do fewer of them. And it's really interesting because there's, there's certainly some companies that do a lot of small bets, and some of them play out. And then there's some, like Amazons, who say, hey, India is a big bet for us, and they put in a couple billion dollars and hope for the best right. um, in a couple of years' time. And you know, I, I think we're, start, we're, we're definitely trying to find our way, um, but we've never been much for let's do a hundred thing and, and hope for the best, just because I can't come up with even a hundred different goals. So I'd rather make a few sort of strategic bets and make sure that we don't fail on, on those. Right. Um, but we're going to make mistakes along the way. And sure. that, I think, is a very important distinction that I don't see startup entre entrepreneurs really get. Like, failure is not something you should strive for. Making mistakes is okay, as long as you make them quick and cheap. Right, really good point. Um, it's also a question of ambition, I guess. Um, and Nicholas, you meet a lot of entrepreneurs um, in your role at Tomico. Do you feel like, in Europe, we're not ambitious enough, or is that changing? So, uh, the ambition level has really been, st been stepped up over the last few years, and uh, because you, you know, people see that you can build great companies from here, 
And this is something sort of that, that we are encouraging entrepreneurs to think all the time, to think bigger. And, um, you know, so, so there's actually, you know, the opposite for us is like if, 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 if an entrepreneur want to be kind of safe and, and not have, you know, well, we want to be careful, we don't want to strive for too much. It's like, you know, then you always challenge them, like, well, if you want to do this in, in one market, why don't you do it globally or in the whole region? And I watched kind of how they react, if there's like, if that, if they, you know, retract, it's like, yeah, if they get really excited about it, that's, that's a good kind of sign, because I think there's still a lot of people around um, entrepreneurs is like, well, pay it safe. But as Donia said, you need, to, you need to really kind of go for it and not be afraid of, of, of that. You know, I think just taking that bigger bet is just so important because if you don't really strive for it, you will never get there. But the ambition level is so much better uh, today. And it's of, certainly we see that here at Slush, there's so many fantastic companies coming here. So this is just going to get better and better. Yeah. And it's good timing to talk about it because just today uh, you released a report on yeah. the state of European tech. Can you share some of the biggest takeaways and also about failure because I know that was part of the yeah. data. So sure. So yeah, we released this uh, report f for the second year together with Slush, the state of European tech. We're trying to kind of lay out, basically looking at data. We did a lot of interviews. And it's just what we see here is uh, a few, you know, maybe three key things. One is that um, there's a lot of deep technology happening now in, 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 in Europe. So it's not just about you know, apps to, to, to make telephone calls or games on uh, some, some music services, it's some, some serious things being addressed, um, <laughs> joke aside. Uh, there's, there's more and more deep tech we're seeing like in, in the UK and a few other places. Actually, also here in Helsinki, there's a lot of uh, machine learning, AI happening. We're seeing more and more hubs happening. So there's, before it was all about uh, London, Berlin, Stockholm. Uh, now we see a lot of other places, obviously Helsinki. But Paris is really taking off. Actually, more investments in, in France and Germany last year in, in technology companies. But also places like Munich, Zurich, uh, where you have very, very strong technical universities. You see great companies from there. Madrid and Lisbon as well. So it's great to see also Southern Europe starting to, um, to take off as well. Right. So this is something that technology has now become contagious. It's kind of happening everywhere. And, and so the encouragement in the smaller um, ecosystems is, is getting better and better. Cool. So going back to the, the actual topic of the session, um, sometimes you make small mistakes that have a significant impact, that have huge consequences. Do you have any anecdotes, stories about small mistakes that made a huge impact? Uh, well, I, 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 I guess several, uh, but um, you know, like I, I probably would go back to like uh, to this like uh, notion of the creative process and how we try to like uh, like sort of uh, sometimes build sort of structure around it, and it's 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 sort of a, for ex I just explained that. Very Supercell probably wouldn't exist un unless we had made those mistakes, like right. back in the, in the in the previous company. But even yet, with having that experience, like at Supercell, there have been times where we've tried to put even like like really really simple rules in in how we think about game development, like things like for example that that okay, every team has a three month window to develop a prototype, and after exactly at the end of the three month window, you need to put the prototype out, and then everybody can play it and they can sort of uh, rate it and give feedback. And even those type of things, like uh, it sounds simple and again like extremely well intended, right? Uh, but they, they just haven't worked out. And 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 you know, and uh, I, I guess again the learning from there is that that you know like then you think the creative process, it actually there really isn't much other process than it. It, it really is all about the people, and now the only piece of process we have is, is that you know that we, all we care about is the, the team that builds the game, and that's the, the, the entire green light process is there. Cool. Daniel, same question. Well, um, I, I kind of look at the, the choices that an entrepreneur has to make, and um, I segment them into what I call low variance problems and high variance problems. And um, one of the mistakes that I think entrepreneurs do, and certainly that I do as well, is that you don't really know, actually in a larger company, the easiest thing to invest in is the low variance problems. Low variance problems are the ones which has little upside in being the best in the world at them, but there's tremendous amount of downside if you don't do them well enough. So the perfect example I have is paying salaries. Um, so obviously, you know, if, you, if you're the best in the world at paying salaries, the marginal, um, you know, 
good of being the best versus being okay is not that high for most people. They just expect to get paid at a certain date. But if you miss that date, then you're screwed. Like, it's really, really bad, and you have severe morale issues, etc. Um, so that's the low variance, whereas high variance is where you have both ups and downs. So I find most startup entrepreneurs are pretty good in the high variance bucket, but it's the low variance part that we just underinvest in. So as an example, in, in our case, you know, we, we, uh, um, we up until pretty recently, um, I, I didn't really pay attention much to this. We were running on an ERP system um, that was stopped being supported by Microsoft in like 2001. And we were still running that thing, um, even to this day. And, and so, like, and, and we're probably 10 times bigger than anyone that's ever used that thing before. So the cost now for us to try to switch that out while having all these processes built up, uh, that's part of that. It means that there's like 200 people that are only working on that uh, for a very, very long time. So what, what, what was a pretty trivial decision back then turn, now turns into this like multi-year thing where we have to migrate everyone over to this new system and keep the two systems in parallel, etc. And I, I find like as you scale your company, the biggest thing is to figure out when, when, when you should actually sort of when is good enough? What, when is the sort of low variance bar threshold met? Um, another one for us has been like HR. Like for a long time, I was like the only HR person, and I didn't really see the value with it, despite having you know hundreds of employees. And so you underinvest in a lot of those, that stuff that was severely hurting us. So you can see that on Glassdoor, for instance, that our ratings as a company was just pretty terrible until we started investing in, in HR and just get better in formalizing some of those processes, get better at how we set salaries so that we're actually fair and just to people, not sort of like, hey, we think yeah. this is kind of where it ought to be. And that's when the scores then started increasing too. But that could be really expensive if you miss your window. So it's, it's one thing to fail your way to success, to make mistakes, overcome them, and then be successful anyway. But sometimes failure means the actual end of companies. Um, Atomico, have, have you invested in any companies that have gone bust? Many, yes. Yeah. And by the way, we, want them, we don't want them to go bust, but we expect about 25% maybe of investments, maybe 25% to a third of companies you invest in should probably be, be write-offs. Right, well, so share, share some key learnings. Why did they fail? Pardon? Why did they fail? The yeah, you know, it, it, it happens, and that's just, you know, it's not a bad thing. So, so, you know, for us, it's like, but it's also interesting because actually in our company, as an investment company, we have fiduciary responsibility, we have investors and so forth. So it's, it's like, we have to train ourselves, like, actually, it's a good thing when, when, when something is, is uh, when a company has to be right, right now, it's a bit difficult decision. Actually, we learned from Ilka, because you, you told me that when, when you guys are killing a game, you have a little bit of a party. Uh, so it's like, you know, because it's a difficult decision to, to kind of to, to make that negative dis decision because we all work with positive things, we want to build things, we want to create things. So, so making those hard decisions is, is and also having, sometimes having those dis discussions with a founder is like, you know, which is, you know, at some point it's like maybe time to, to, um, to move on and to try something else, which is difficult because I think also great founders are the ones who have resilience, who are not giving up when everyone else is just kind of don't believe in you because as, as a founder, you have to be the one, you have to be the last captain on that. If that's a sinking ship, you should be the last, you, the captain should be the last one leaving, and, and, but you really, really have to try it because there's many times when it looks as darkest and you can just pull, pull through and maybe you can come out on that other side and you're going to come out really, really strong. Right. And uh, so, so that's always a hard, I think it's a hard kind of decision, so kind of when to pull that plug or not. It's, and I don't know if there's like a, in a, there's not a theoretical kind of answer to that. You just have to kind of, you know, use your judgment. Sure. What, what do you think, Nicholas? What, what is like the largest, um, is, is there a pattern you see in the ones that are failing? Is it? Is it, is it uh, founding team? The, 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 or between failure and, and successes is, is always the team. It's like the founding team is always the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, reason for either or. And we've seen that when we invested in, in companies that we maybe really love the thesis, the opportunity and the product, and, and we want this to be great. And, but the team is maybe not dedicated enough. They're not, they're not passionate enough because what you need to do to succeed is really, by the way, it's really, really hard 
to, 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 uh, uh, to get funding and to then, if you got funding to succeed, the odds are against you. So it really it requires extraordinary people to, to be successful. And, but what I think the common thread among successful entrepreneurs is resilience, passion, and you're like, you're in the zone. You need to like, you need to live for what you do. You need to kind of embrace it totally. And you need to and, 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 and go out and, and have a mission and something that you really want to solve. Yeah. That is big, that's always the bigger, bigger thing than, than you know, the product or... But, yeah. but wouldn't you say that also like timing, like timing i.e. Is, luck, is, yeah. a, is a big factor? Awesome, yes. For me, was, we had, Casal was too early. Skype was, was um, um, perfect timing. I think, when you, I think you had the right timing. We should have done Casal a few years later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only disagreement I have. But other than that, yeah. 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 Um, that's the other thing about, about companies. They usually take a lot longer to build than most people imagine, um, which means you also have more room for mistakes in the early days that can kind of kill the company, which is unfortunate. But it's, uh, and this is a horribly cl cliche question. I apologize in advance. But uh, for the first time founders in the room, what's some of the advice that you would give to like, starting entrepreneurs other than be persistent, which is an obvious one? But. Yeah, uh, well, you know, well, first of all, like, don't ever, ever give up and, and uh, you know, try to go after that like really, really big dream, and you know, and you know, just keep on, keep on taking risks. And, and uh, the one advice probably that I would have about taking risks is that I think sometimes people misunderstand that as that you know, I'm gonna try like 20 different things at the same time. So I'm just throw stuff on the wall and I'll see what sticks. I in, in my opinion, especially very early on, you don't have that many people. Maybe you have like five, six, maximum ten people in your team. There's only so much stuff that you can do. And I, I, I do believe that focus is, is really, really important. So try to find something risky. <laughs> uh, try to find a risky focus area and, you know, really like go after it hard. And, and, and then, you know, like uh, obviously you need to change course if it doesn't work out. But, uh, you know, Take, go do those sort of a big bets with a, with a small team. Sure. And, and you've touched on this, but um, it's different starting a company and scaling a company takes a different skill set. So Daniel, I would love to know what did you have to learn to go from starting Spotify to actually scaling it up? Well, I, I think like there's different skill sets for every face of a company. Like there, there's, there's one when you're actually starting the company, there's one where you're 50 people, there's one where you're like 150 people, there's one where you're 1,000 people, and one where you're like 10,000 people. So um, I, I usually tell people that I change jobs about every two years. Um, and I started as the, the sort of janitor, and then I became the product guy, and then I sort of became the HR person, and then I became the content person who negotiated all the deals, et cetera. So there's many phases um, through uh, the company's existence where you as the founder have to take on many different hats. Um, and it's really hard. You have to be pretty versatile as a person uh, to be able to do that. Um, and, and, and yes, it's, it's like different phases, but, but I, I think this is what people get wrong because society and everyone else will tell you it's different. But in reality, it's sort of the same thing. Like you have to communicate in a different way, um, and there's some of the processes that has to be there that isn't there. But you have to cut through all of that bullshit and just focus on what's important, which is still creating the best possible product that you can for your customers and providing the best possible value in solving whatever need they have. And it's really that, and just building that team. And yes, building the team means you're working through other people instead of just working on it directly. But, but there's, I, I don't think that there's much distinction. I mean, my view, it's interesting, Nicholas talking about sort of team. We've, we've, we've come out on the other side. I acquire companies now. So part of my innovation and part of the things that you see that you probably love the most about Spotify has been companies we've acquired, which is really interesting. Um, and, and what I look for at is a, a, a team especially three or four people um, who are really tight-knit together and have worked together before, because what we find is whatever projects we do, the best performing projects inside of the company, much similar to a startup, is like when you have three or four people who just really click, yeah. ideally they've worked together before, because early on in a startup, like you typically hire people you know are good. Like you don't go out and like put it on a job board. You put people together that you've like, oh, I've I've heard this person is amazing, or I've worked with person X before, and you hire them. 
And, and if, if you're really careful about the first five or six hires, I think that's the life and death. That's the first life and death of a company. Um, so I think that's like the most important thing that we kind of look for now when, when we acquire companies and pull them in, just getting the right team. And then the second thing um, is getting them the right mission. And, and mission would probably be translated in the startup world of you know, being um, stubborn on the vision that you have of the problem you're trying to solve, but flexible on the details on how you're solving that problem. Right. Um, and, but that's kind of like the two most important things for us. Yeah, but that's a really important point. The culture of the company, which I find from what I've seen, is always founders top down. If you have certain norms and values as a founder, then usually that translates, that trickles down to the rest of the company. Um, but I'm wondering, if, is, have you seen any ways that you can kind of ease that process of maintaining the right culture within companies that you're scaling? You know, um, maintaining this environment where you can innovate, where you can take risks, and where you encourage people to actually do that. Are there any tricks and tips that you can share? I think you need to build a very strong um, um, culture early on, and it's always coming from the founders. And that's also why I'm saying that you need to have founders who are so passionate about what they're doing, and also being on a mission to solve a problem, and it's like, this is where we're going, guys. This is the mountain. I don't know exactly how we're going to get there, but we're going to get there. And, and you may not know, you're just, and you, you figure it out on the way. And you, and you then build a culture, very, very strong passion culture, mission-driven culture early on then you can, you can maintain that. But it requires a lot of work also from the founders that, because early on, the, kind of the, the founding team around the founders, they all kind of embrace it because as a founder, you interact a lot with the team. If you don't scale very, very fast, you need to be really, then you need to communicate a lot. Uh, and if you ha because you have a lot of new people who haven't been with a company for a long time. If they start to interview new people, and the, you, you can lose that culture. So that's something you have to really manage very well. Because once you've lost it, it's really hard to kind of get it back. Yeah, I think Supercell is actually a really good example of a very, very mission-driven. Um, I was at your office yesterday, and you showed your goal with the company. Can you share that? Uh, yeah, so well, we have this very, very simple goal that we want to uh, create games that people will play for years, if not for decades, and which then would uh, become part of the rich history of games, and that really sort of drives us. And, 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 uh, but uh, like going back to your question about like, how do you sort of sustain the culture, I mean, I mean, the only rule that we've kind of noticed that it sort of works is that you try to hire as slowly as possible. So there seems to be this like limit of how many people you can add right. uh, yeah. per, per month, for example. And some people tell me that, yeah, you know, but then you're taking sort of an easy, easy way out. But, you know, that's what we've found out. That's and me, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, but, you know, uh, but that, that's one way to like think about it. Uh, and, 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 but I also like, I actually also like, there's one, there are like other advantages advantages that become, well, come from like being, being small. So obviously you need less process and it's easier to sustain the culture. But also sometimes also creativity actually uh, fosters in this when you have like scarce resources. So that can also be a, be a good thing. And when it comes to culture, I mean, I agree with Niklas that of course it sort of comes from the founders in a sense that the founders by definition are the first people who hire other people. But once you can get these people in, uh, then I, I think it's super important that the culture is shared by everybody. And, it, it's, and, and you know, those people who have just come in are equally important for the culture as the founders are. So I, I think yeah. it's, uh, sometimes people do this artificial like boundaries between founders and the others and leadership. We, we'd like to more think that you know, we are all in this to, sort of together. And I, I actually think, or would like to think Supercell as a, a, a company of like 210 entrepreneurs and you know, people who don't really need a leader. And, it, and it, culture is sort of everybody's responsibility. Right. But I mean, inevitably, if you get to a company the, the size of Spotify now, for example, inevitably you're going to hire people that are not necessarily in tune with your culture. They just want a job, they want to punch a clock, and they leave in the evening, and that's it. How do you avoid that having an effect on the rest of the company? Well, um, so, you know, and I, I, I tend to look at the world in terms of missionaries versus mercenaries. So you kind of have to screen for other factors like passion for mission and things like that. 
um, which is super important. I'm not saying necessarily everyone at Spotify is like hardcore into music. That's not important. But sometimes the mission itself could be interpreted differently by individuals. Um, so it could be a subset of the mission that's super appealing to someone. So if you're a data scientist, you, you may actually not care that much per, per se about music, but you care how people interact with music. Right. And that becomes the thing that kind of latches you on and makes you feel like this is something I need to understand and, and, and feel like. But I, I think, again, this is kind of one of the things that people, people talk a lot about the culture and they talk about the culture when it changes and like we, we need the culture to remain like it was when, when it began. That's not the culture we have at Spotify, just honestly. But part of that is also because, you know, I was 23 when I started Spotify. I'm 33 now. I was single and 23 and I was spraying champagne on people in bars uh, down in downtown Stockholm. And today I'm like semi-boring. I have two kids at home. I go home and I watch uh, Homeland and some TV series and do emails and then fall yeah. asleep and start over again. So the, the point being is um, I'm, I'm a different person. I think I roughly have the same values. But I'm, I'm, I've obviously grown and matured. I used to think that people who went and, and picked up their kids at daycare were losers and like were checking out too early. That's the honest truth. Whereas today, I have a totally different appreciation for how, why that is important and why work-life balance is super important um, as well. So, you know, I, I think the company culture changes over time as you as a founder and CEO also change with the company. Um, so the things that were necessarily important to Spotify in the beginning isn't identically important to the company today. Um, it's not important that we have people sleeping under the desk. In fact, we, we say that that's the culture we don't want. Right. We think creative people think better when they have a balance in their life. Right. Um, and that is a very big difference from where we were in the beginning because it was super important in the beginning because we only had so many people that everyone put in 12-hour workdays and we were inspired by the things we saw in Silicon Valley. And I think, you know, you asked backstage what is different about Nordics or someone asked backstage. And I think it is like that value sense of like family, um, equality, um, the fact that, you know, um, there's this safety net that exists in all of these countries um, right. that, that for some would say prohibits entrepreneurship, but I'd say encourages entrepreneurship, which is obviously very different. So going back to the, the actual topic of failure, um, something that we see in Europe quite a lot is that there's, there's still the stigma on failure. It's not okay to fail. Yeah. You don't get a second chance. It's hard to get a loan from the bank if you failed your business once. So that's something that you can't easily fix. It's going to take time, maybe even generations until that culture of failure kind of changes. What, we, what can we do to kickstart it or to help I think it? it is happening. I mean, it is really happening where where it's now becoming okay to go out and start companies and, and to fail. I mean, you know, 10 years ago when, when, when people thought, well, maybe I'm going to start a company, it's like, and people around, they probably everyone around you, your family, your friends, and it's like, oh, you know, no, you shouldn't do that because, you know, what about your job? What about your pension? And what about if you fail? I think that's changing. I think it's like in the last 10 years, it has changed leap, leaps and bounds. And... Um, and I think this is just, we just, you need to continue to do what we have, have great slushes and, and, and uh, talk about these things openly. That, that's, I think, is something that is great. And, but I will also say that even with the investment community, venture capitalists, there's also this like, well, we don't want to have our companies fail. And then they don't encourage. So then, then you might sometimes have investors and board members who kind of, when you have a founder who's like, we want to out, go out and change the world, and like the investor's like, well, maybe you want to take it a bit easy because we don't want you to kind of potentially fail. And that's, that's also a culture we need to change. That's certainly one of the things that, one of the key reasons we started Atomico 10 years ago, because we want to kind of encourage entrepreneurs to go all the way and to, and to build their businesses. And, and also on the same kind of topic is on terms of, you know, mistakes that investors are doing many times uh, is that when a company is scaling and, 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 and the founders who has never run a big company making a few mistakes because they haven't been in that situation before and maybe there's a, some, some kind of ups and downs in the performance and then the board gets really nervous and well, we need to have some professional management. That is usually the biggest mistake a board can do. Uh, if you look at the most successful companies in the world, 
they're all led by founders who are very focused on innovation and building fantastic, innovative, risk-taking cultures. And by the way, many times have the investors wanted to kind of replace those founders. And whenever they did, that was a big mistake. So for me, it's always about supporting founders and allowing them to learn along the way and, 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 and give support and encouragement. Mm -hmm. I think oh. the, one of the problems is that we tend to, I mean, the community tends to only celebrate entrepreneurs who have been successful, and, and the only way to get people to talk about their mistakes, like, like today, is to get successful people to talk about their mistakes. But I, I think it's sort of a shame that if you think that, say, that there's 10 companies who are starting, maybe one of those entrepreneurs is successful, and that means that nine aren't. Right. But I, I think we should create a kind of environment there, like we would encourage those nine people who have, quote, failed, try again. And, yeah. and you know, to me, those type of people who have failed, 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 and yet they try again, and, and uh, those are, like, to me, are the real heroes of entrepreneurships. Right. And they should be celebrated. That's a very good point to end this conversation. We're all out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a real delight. Thank you so much for listening as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well done.